and standards. It may be arguably valid to state that public universities appear to be central to today's discourse. However, it is appropriate to opine that it has become increasingly expedient to find new ways of handling universities' funding generally. Failure to immediately review the status quo only promises greater consequences. The dangers of inaction could be monumental, and the federal government and the private schools owners have the inevitable burden of cultivating and repositioning the system. Whether it is in the provision of infrastructure or meeting of other operational resources needs of the higher education sector, how to secure a sustainable future for the nation's critical human capital development calls for urgent actions. We must never downplay the popular saying, give enough monkeys, enough typewriters, and you will find the entire works of Shakespeare in a few years. Education costs money, and quality education demands more money, I dare say. To meet its purpose for establishment, a university needs qualified manpower administrative buildings and classrooms, laboratory blocks and equipment, library structure, and up-to-date books and resource holdings. Investment in research, student support, and community engagement bear no less important emphasis. We need the place, the manpower, the students, and modern tools to deliver innovative and cutting edge knowledge to meet the expectations of today's communities who, on minute basis, reach out to an ever emerging global space. We can sum up my whole discourse here to one thing. Quality higher education calls for increased funding. No rationalization can give a better alternative and the government and the proprietors of higher institutions must back their dreams with naked financial deposit. Naked, I say, because investing in education is not one of the quickest avenues for return on investment. Those who sponsor investments in educational projects must not do so with a mindset to early recovery of the outlay of profit. My Mr. President, Vice Chancellor, no matter how slow the returns might seem, not investing adequately today is an invitation to a dismal outcome tomorrow. Those who invest in education do not go into it for mere fun of it. They do because the nation needs quality manpower to back up industrialization, effective and efficient leadership, whether in business, politics, or community life. They invest because the nation must continue to evolve for better as long as and the opportunity for self-development. For a thorough look at where we are, how to get to where we should be as a nation, as an institution, public or private, or as an individual, forms one of the ends of my inaugural lecture today. Traditional sources of higher education funding. We'll find this section in pages 9 to 20. This centers on how normally the education in Nigeria is funded. And we have three perspectives 
considered in this lecture. One is public, the other is private, and then the third is individual. On public, we have a combination of the federal government and uh, the state government. The literature has it that the state funds education as of now to the level of 80%. What that means is that the public universities are so much dependent on what comes from the government. One of the avenues that the government has tried to find solution to the problem of inadequate funding here includes the establishment of the Tertiary Education Trust Fund, third fund, which comes in the immediate in the area of infrastructural development. Um, I will talk a little bit more about the third fund in the course of the presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, what we find at present is that because of the situation, what we could consider majorly now, the collapse of the oil economy, uh, and then in Nigeria struggling with the exchange rate, we find a situation where the government is not able to do much of what it's supposed to do. The state governments also depend on the states, the, sorry, the state universities depend on the states. And what we find is that the condition of the state universities is uh, so much closely like the states of the states themselves. Because in many of the states, we find the government owing salaries to workers running up to six months. In a particular place, I will not mention right here now, but you know, some workers are owed 31 months. They were owed 31 months before a new government came in. What happens is that we try to resolve this experience by looking at what we call the African political economy. And what does this say? This one says that when states or governments find themselves in that kind of financial problem, they present education as the least of their troubles. And that's what you find today. They are able to fund, like I mentioned before, they can fund military security and all of the other things, including uh, fuel subsidy. But education is like an afterthought. We have uh, in some of the pages there, page 14, page 15, some tables which you can sit down on your own and look through. What we are presenting is kind of proof that in all these years mentioned here, whether it is in the very many years gone behind or just the last seven years, you can see that government is failing in meeting the expectation in this area. When we consider the private sector, Ladies and gentlemen, if uh, it was a, a less relaxed uh, presentation, one could call for an applause for private universities. Because what you find is that it is the proprietor alone that funds the university once the tag is private. And you find out that even those private universities go to give some money to government to come for accreditation and other inspection services. There is no way any government is helping any private university. Ladies and gentlemen, even the very question of allowing the lecturers in private universities to benefit from research funding that is offered by third fund third fund which is financed from profits of companies in Nigeria. And the private universities themselves joining to produce manpower for the whole nation. No private university produces manpower for the private proprietor. 
the private professors, private university professors, are not allowed to benefit. What they do is a contrivement. They ask them to join any other professor in another public university. I call that one playing spare. They are there as second fiddle. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that these are some areas that the funding of our private our uh, universities at the moment are not doing well. Mr. President, Vice Chancellor, if the public universities are facing trouble with funding, the private universities are not better off at all. I have collaborated in research that centered on the funding of private universities both in Nigeria and Ghana. And our findings showed that funding was the foremost challenge facing private universities in Nigeria. The third source of financing presently is individual. Ladies and gentlemen, I would be shocked if uh, it was only in my village in the 60s and 70s that the community came together to fund their sons who went abroad or went to Sierra Leone or some other uh, countries where education was offered. And what happened then was that a child going to university belongs to everybody. The community can even uh, use the palm, palm fruits of the community to train somebody's child in the hope that that person is going to bring good to the nation. Well, I think uh, if I use my own place, uh, my Royal Highness is here, sir. If I use my own as an instance, I would think that that thing ended after the Civil War. Since after the Civil War, every human being is on his own. If you want to go to school, it's either your parents have saved money, done some contribution, or kept themselves like my father and my mother without food sometimes. They deferred the full enjoyment of their life to make sure that their children went to school. That's the situation we have today. Some families had sold some of their private properties they have sold land, they have sold automobile, and done so many activities to make sure that their children go to school. I return to reading now from page 20 of the book, Funding Experience from Other Clients. Funding Experience from Other Clients. A review of the funding practice of some major developing and developed countries around the world inform a typical structure. In South Africa, United Kingdom, most of Europe, and United States of America, funding education, whether public or private institutions, of their revenue through tuition source, and 42% come from the same source to private institutions. While revenue from the state government constitutes the largest single source of revenue for public institutions, the sum is devoted to core functions, such as instructional program. Private institutions receive only 2% from the state as forms of grants or contracts awarded for specific purposes, such as special research or training project. The state government does not normally grant any funding to general operating purpose. Local government supports revenue of public institutions to the tune of 4% and 1% for private institutions. The funds are channeled to the institutions on a competitive basis as grants or contracts. I repeat that. The funds are channeled to the institutions 
on a competitive basis as grants or contracts. Both public and private sources attract 22% share of the revenue from sales and services. These include revenue from rental of dormitory rooms and cafeteria meals. Other source is the financial aid provided to students from the federal government programs, which comes in billions of dollars. Public and private universities here depend on their abilities to obtain funds from variety of sources. Each university works hard to attract tuition paying and financial aid receiving students. The dormitories and dining halls compete with private sector vendors to win grants and contracts from the federal, state, and local government. We can read further notes there by that reference to Wolani 2015, page five. Table four provides a summary of the different sources of funds for the university, U, U.S. tertiary institutions. The table evidences that 19% of the funding of public universities came from tuition fees, while that of private institutions were 42%. The federal, state, and local governments provided 51% and 17% of the funds of the public and private universities, respectively. In the foregoing notes, ability of the institutions to compete for resources is of huge prominence in forms of contracts, awards, and consulting services. You can look at that table to see summary of those uh, figures. In Wales, higher education sector is funded by the Higher Education Funding Council for Wales. The council has responsibility to distribute funds for education, research, and related activities at higher education institutions in Wales. The council also funds teaching activities of the Open University of Wales and the higher education colleges. The Welsh government provides the funds and the Higher Education Funding Council of Wales to secure high quality higher education, learning, and research, make contribution of higher education to culture, society, and economy of Wales, allocate the university's tuition grant for full-time undergraduate students, and it ensures high-quality accredited teacher training across Wales. The point of these references is the endorsement of quality, strategic distribution of government funds to Welsh universities and colleges. I will stop it there. The point made is that their own use of resources targets quality and strategic distribution. But in South Africa, we find a system that is likened to that of the United States. The basic source of financing are the Department of Higher Education and Training block grants based on the system of full-time equivalents and the student fees. For most universities, the state support on average accounts for more than two-thirds of their unrestricted revenue. All the universities in South Africa, public or private, charge tuition and receive government support of varying proportions as well. While it can be said that each country reviewed here adopted a system of universities funding of their conviction, 
the motive appeared to be directed towards ensuring improved and quality performance of the universities. Manifestations of underfunding of higher education in Nigeria. We'll find this in pages 25 to 34. And I will just mention some of the key, the highlights of some of the things that are wrong with underfunding. Number one is long drawn strikes by the academic and non-academic unions. This one does not need much explanation in Nigeria because we live with it. Number two, unpaid salaries, allowances, and non-competitive packages. Lecturers who are here know what I'm talking about. Your salaries are not the best. You cannot compare your salaries with those of politicians or some other persons who are in better organized systems in the private sector. So what we find here is that even what is promised, paying it when it comes to public universities is not something that is common. I know I have said before, places where workers are owed very many months, and each time they see their lot on the salary heading, they go to church and give thanksgiving. Number three, poorly equipped laboratories and libraries. The librarians and the laboratory technologists who are here will agree with me that what you have in your laboratories today can be better. It's not what is supposed or what can give the cutting edge research that the nation needs for innovative products and uh, students, uh, sorry, graduates who can make the difference that is needed to transform our country. Because there is not enough money, many of the laboratories are empty. If you have not tried to do uh, research for some areas of PhD studies in the sciences, you will not understand the magnitude of the problem we're talking about here. I'm aware of a student who had to send some of the research materials to South Africa to do the analysis because the equipment we have here cannot do. And I know another that has been constrained from graduating because they cannot get the right equipment to and of course, in the libraries, you find books. Many of them have large volumes. But volumes of what? Volumes of donated books which are written with the foreign background that cannot bring any solution to our problem because those were donated uh, to those libraries. Number four, debt of ICT infrastructure. Well, maybe some of you are aware, and I do know there are many, that there are some computer students in some of the public universities, I'm sorry, I'm discussing your problems, who went through the school without having up to 10 hours of computer practicals before they graduated. That is really a sad situation. Go to the, I'm aware, I uh, used to say we should not use what we find to make public uh, lecture. I will not call names, therefore, some places you go to and you find out that the computers in the computer laboratory don't bear the names of the universities. And when you put your feet down to find out why, then you realize that those computers were actually borrowed for the purpose of that accreditation. That's where we find ourselves, because they don't have, the money is not enough. 
inadequate hostel accommodation, maybe Babcock University students should be rejoicing because here I'm sure the university provides accommodation for up to 98% of the population enrolled. There are places where students just have to go to the nearest places in the corner and look for accommodation. My uh, vice chancellor in Adelaide University will agree with me that in his days in the University of Ibadan, it was a proud thing to be uh, a citizen of uh, uh, a hostel. Your accommodation was something that you, you put your hands like this to walk about and talk about. But that's not the case today. You find students and, of course, talk about uh, uh, where they stay to foment trouble for the university. They stay outside the university and uh, get into courtist activities. Uh, then they come back and fight their institutions. Insufficient funding of research. This is another very unfortunate situation. How can you transform the nation if in teaching the students you yourself cannot conduct a research that can make a difference. Because everyone that conducts a research has to use his own personal funds to do that. Only very few private universities, if you are lucky to be in one of these, that will grant cash to their workers to go and conduct research. The rest of the places, you are just on your own. We, now I talked about what is wrong with third fund. As far as those of us from the uh, private university pedigree are concerned, you'll find that we are forced to go to our sister institutions who are public to join with others to do research. We are not allowed to stay on our own because if we do, the money will not get to us. That is unfortunate. And I have uh, written in this work that that situation needs to change. I have had arguments somewhere that, oh, it's a policy thing. Policy? Policy was made by Nigerians for Nigerians. And I want to insist that that kind of policy should change so that third fund will look at every lecturer in Nigeria as part of the solution to the Nigerian problem. Non-sponsorship of lecturers to conferences. Those who are lecturers here know what I'm talking about. Some good private university ask you to go to and have one paid for. In some places, that opportunity is not even there. So, if you can't go to conference, how can you renew your knowledge? Those n conferences provide avenue for renewal of knowledge. Number eight, poorly equipped lecturers' offices. Another one here, in some of the places we visit, you'll find out that in the professor's office, the only thing that belongs to that office is the table and the chair. The other things they bring in there, including visitors' chairs, we are brought in so that you who just came to inspect can see and get away. I've had the misfortune of visiting a professor's office, who could, a professor who could not direct a visitor where the toilet is. <laughs> Number nine, low student sponsorships and loans. Immediately I talk about loans, our minds will go to what the government has just promised. Of course, uh, those who have been in this land for a while, we know that that promise may not be all there is because politicians will know when to promise and when to hold back. Ladies and gentlemen, there are only very few universities in this country today who give scholarships to their own students? Very few. Because the fund is not enough. Number 10, 
inadequate care of the environment. There are also very few universities who have enough money to maintain the environment. I'm talking about physical environment now, where you can go in and say, oh, this is looking like a place of learning. Very few. And when I say very few, those of you who are familiar with some places that I know will know the ones I am referring to who have done well in this area. There are many that you cannot get into that place and consider that somebody can stay in that environment and acquire quality knowledge. All right, now we go back to